Act 2. Scene 1. Gord Lake. Why did you call me here? What are you doing? It's been 15 years since that day. Wait! Just stay calm! Father! Let go of my father! You can't imagine how I've suffered! You... suffered? You're killing him! What are you... Merry Christmas. Miles Edgeworth appears on stage with a dazed expression, holding a gun. He looks down at it, drops it, and runs away. Scene 2. As the morning dawns, a crowd gathers in People Park, all reading newspapers and gossiping among each other. An unidentified body was found in Gord Lake late last night. A lone suspect was discovered at the scene of the crime. Prosecutor Miles Edgeworth, age 24. Better known as the Demon Prosecutor, Edgeworth has long been under scrutiny for his extreme tactics in the courtroom. But this arrest has concerned citizens wondering, could he be guilty of far worse? Guilty! He did it! He's the one. The demon's misdeeds leave him nowhere to run. Guilty, 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 guilty. He's murderous, cold-hearted, and merciless. We can't wait till justice is served. From dirty prosecution to bloody execution, Miles Edgeworth will get what he deserves. Since the first time I saw him, he'd do it, I said. You saw how hard he fought for that scumbag red. Frankly, I'm surprised it's the first one he shot. He's probably done much worse and just hasn't, hasn't been caught. This can't be true, Mr. Edgeworth. What they're saying about you, it's a lie. It has to be. I won't believe it. There's just no way that you are guilty. No, I won't accept this. No, I won't allow this. This can't be justice. I just can't stand this. This is not what he deserves. It's obvious to everyone he's guilty. He's guilty, until he's proven innocent. He's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. and he'll get what he deserves. Oh hey, look, on page two, a real life lake monster spotted in Gord Lake. They're calling it Gordy. No oh, way. The crowd's no, mood turns on a dime. They exit, now excitedly talking about this next topic of gossip. Gumshoe is left alone as the scene transitions into the detention center. Won't someone believe in him? Won't somebody help him? Isn't there anybody willing to fight someone to make it? <gasps> he pulls out his phone and dials a number. Mr. Wright? It's an emergency. Uh, no, listen, you gotta... It's Mr. Edgeworth. You gotta get to the detention center now, pal. What do you mean you're already... Phoenix enters, still with his phone to his ear, looking straight at Gumshoe. We saw the headlines. Of course we were coming. They hang up their phones and tuck them back in their jackets. Actually, we were in the middle of opening presents. Where's Edgeworth? Is he... In detention. I just need you guys to talk to him. That's going to be tough. I don't think he wants to ever see me again, let alone talk. What are you talking about, pal? Ever since the Red White case, Mr. Edgeworth seemed, well, obsessed with you. Always wandering around, singing about wanting you to see him as a man. I get your point. Look, don't hold your breath. Thank you so much, pal. Maggie enters and spots Gumshoe. Dick, oh, there you are. 
You weren't answering your calls. Oh, uh, sorry, Maggie. The chief is holding a special meeting with all of our investigators. We gotta go now. But... Maggie has already nearly dragged him out of the room. Sorry, pals. I'm sure he'll be there soon enough. Phoenix and Maya are left alone. Tension fills the detention center, a place which both of them are far too familiar with. So much for merry and bright. Thanks for coming, Maya. I couldn't do this without my co-counsel. Hey, I get it. Someone's gotta be your backup against that demon prosecutor, right? She punches the air a few times. <clears throat> you know he'll be behind bulletproof glass, right? Edgeworth, immaculately groomed and clearly exhausted, is led into the visiting cell and locked in. When he catches sight of Phoenix, he starts to turn back around to leave, but cannot open the door. Oh, come on, Edgeworth. Phoenix sits in the visitor's chair, and Maya makes her way over much more reluctantly. What do you want, Wright? Come to laugh at the fallen prosecutor. Very well, then. Laugh! I'm waiting! Just drop the melodrama. We don't have so much spare time that we can come down here just to laugh at you. Yes, you do. I had hoped you wouldn't come. Go on, tell me. What is it you have to say? You first. What happened? How did things end up this way? We heard about it in all the wrong places. Edgeworth, please tell us. We won't let you face this alone. Hello. Edgeworth, let me defend you. What? Nick, why? Guilty of being a cowardly man. That is the luck of this prosecutor. I must have had some small flaw in my guard. I guess this is where I fall apart. I won't let that happen. But he condemns people every day. He didn't even care that we were innocent. I suppose I should be sorry to all those who opposed me. Every attorney, every last client was guilty thanks to me. Edgeworth, this is no time to be a right. Why on earth are you helping all this guy? I know that you're all innocent. That I said, you right there all that I've innocent. done. You're innocent. I'm only one. And you? Convince me. Go on right. Tell me of my innocence. Don't be so damn trite. You know I'm deep into this. There's more on the line, no honest way out. There's no more time for you to learn what law's about. But I've won every case. Both of them. What an ace. Like it or not, you're an amateur. You have to lose some time, and I'd rather it wasn't on my account. Don't you dare talk that way to Nick. He won because he fought for the truth. Are you afraid of the truth? <laughs> That's what I thought. Edgeworth, you didn't do it, did you? One lingering thought fills my mind, burdening me with anxiety. Edgeworth, did you Crime do it? deserves penance, and I've done all I could. Why bother helping me? This serves the greater good. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. Don't ask me to leave while you wallow in fear. Can't you believe that you don't stand alone? I'm One here. What fills my mind? Let me fight! Not on my behalf! I can make this Go right! Go ahead and Step laugh! Step into I the don't light! I don't deserve to Let be Let me free. save you! There's you can steal the tone! No need for despair! I find my hands where I will win this, I swear! Just tell me the There's truth. nothing to tell! Tell me the truth! Tell me the truth! Tell me the truth! There's just nothing to tell! Leave you're me not alone! alone. Please, just leave me alone, all right? Edgeworth pointedly avoids looking at Phoenix as he is escorted back to his holding cell. Phoenix stands, still staring after him. Maya re-enters. Nick! Phoenix snaps back to Earth. Maya! Nick, look, I don't like him, but I do trust you. But if we find out he did it, you owe me three burgers for a week. Hey, 
I already pay for those. Come on, co-counsel. Where are we headed? They exit. Fade to black. Scene 3. The Criminal Affairs Department. Chief Prosecutor Lana Skye is speaking to the police when Maggie and Gumshoe enter. A guilty conviction, no matter the cost, that is the fate of the prosecutor. I consider our work to be the cornerstone of peace and order. Security is our trade, but We've been dealt a near fatal blow, the Blue Corp scandal. Well, you all know the mess it made, and the less said there, the better. Now we have a chance to turn this travesty around and save our reputation with this bust. So if you want their respect, get the verdict they expect. And that's how we'll regain the public's trust. We'll fight for law and order, no matter what the cost. And we will give no quarter till we regain what we lost. What have we done? We killed the truth, replaced it with lies. Isn't this how justice done? Isn't it our job to make guilty? Pardon? Uh, I did. It's just. Your job, detective, is to follow orders. The prosecution expects a perfect case, and we will provide nothing less. Am I understood? Take note, detective. If you want to keep your badge, I suggest you decide whose side you're on. You can trust me, pal. Then get out there and do your damn job. Dismissed. Dick, you should probably listen to the chief. You can't afford to lose this job. I joined the force to help people. To make a difference. What we're doing, what we've been doing, it ain't right. I consider myself to be a real man's man, see? The kind of guy who won't back down from a fight. I flopped this job a lot, pal, and I gave it all I got Because I thought that we were doing right But this is something different We're not making bad guys pay If they're guilty until proven innocent The real perp gets away So no matter what I did before There's some things I can't ignore And I'll face the consequences if I must Cause when the sticks are high, I can't stand idly by I'll be the kind of guy that they can't trust What are you going to do? Follow orders. The Chief's right. It's time I do my damn job. Metal detector in hand, Gumshoe exits toward the lake. Maggie hesitates, then follows after him. Scene 4. Gourd Lake. Phoenix and Maya enter. There is a Gourd Lake snack stand with a banner reading, Now with Samurai Dogs. Perched on the stand is a parrot, Polly. Next to the stand is a large wooden cutout of the steel samurai, hand cut and drawn with questionable technique. The shore otherwise seems peaceful and tranquil. Wow, this lake is beautiful. I should come here to train sometime. I guess the scene of a murder would be a good place to channel spirits. Maya gives him a sarcastic look. How's your training been going anyway? Well, you know... Trying to avoid this conversation, Maya spots the cutout next to the food stand and gasps with delight. <gasps> Nick, look! It's the Steel Samurai! The what? Come on, Nick! The Steel Samurai Warrior of Neo-Old Tokyo? The award-winning kids TV show? Fights for great justice? Never heard of it. But I'm amazed you can tell what this piece of plywood is supposed to be. Who in the world would use this to advertise their food stand? Oh, come on, man! Leave that alone! Of course. Larry enters, fending off the boat shop caretaker and trying to keep him from messing with the snack stand. I need everything to be perfect for when Angel gets here. Larry, 
What's going on here? Keith? That you? Is that Meg with you? Where have you been? The caretaker stumbles toward Phoenix and Maya, who take a step back. That rapscallion is trying to drive business away from the pasta shop. Pasta shop? Dude, you rent boats! Right over there! Heck, I was there yesterday, remember? Wait, Larry, you were here? Nonsense. If it didn't exist, I would have this jingle. Oh no, please don't. Oh, pasta shop, pasta everywhere. Pasta shop, pasta in your hair. Now listen up, you whippersnapper. Take all this junk, I want it gone. Do you think you own this lake? You kids get off my lawn. What junk? What kids? What lawn? Yesterday is hazy. Ten years ago, it's all a blur. But Polly remembers, remembers the way things were. And you know the wet noodle, don't you, girl? Wet noodle! Wet noodle! Aw, what a cute bird. Polly, Polly, hey there, gal. Polly, Polly! Oh, hey, wow. Hold on. Larry, please focus up. You heard what I asked, right? Do you have the slightest clue what happened here oh, last night? the no wet noodles where it's at to get a real good deal. The best place by the lake for a tasty meal. Okay, Larry, did you- Pasta shop, pasta everywhere. Pasta shop, pasta in your hair. Phoenix stops the caretaker in his tracks, who chokes from ending the song so abruptly. <laughs> Sir, listen, I really need to talk with my friend here. Why, I gotta... Something catches Polly's attention. She flies off in the direction of the boat shop. Polly? What's wrong? Sweetie, use your words. The caretaker chases after Polly. Jeez, what an obnoxious character. Must be hard to deal with someone so erratic. I know, right? Look, Larry, did you say you were here last night? Yeah, man. What's up? So you know about the murder, right? What? It wasn't me, I swear! I was just running the stand, I was gone before midnight! Uh, don't worry, I believe you. But with your luck, I'm surprised you weren't the one arrested for it instead of Edgeworth. Edgeworth? Like our friend? Miles Atticus Edgeworth! From grade school? What? The three of you were kids together? Yeah. Good old Edgy. Always going on about being a defense attorney like his dad. Hold on. He wanted to defend people? But he's the demon prosecutor now. Nick, is that why? Yeah. Edgeworth and you, Larry. You're the two that inspired me to become a defense attorney in the first place. Huh? Really? Remember in the fourth grade? When Edgeworth's lunch money got stolen. Oh, uh... I think so. It's been a long time, man. I could never forget. A single accusation was all that it took. In the blink of an eye, I went from classmate to crook. Alone, hopeless, terrified, I've never felt so weak. My sentence was decided long before Guilty. I could speak. Guilty. Guilty, he did it! Guilty, it was you! Guilty, admit it! Did you rob a bank too? What? I'm not a thief! Guilty, he's lying, your honor, he's trying to pin the blame on some other you! Not me, me! We won't be fooled, we'll wait till you roll, and force me to try to tell the truth! Their disbelieving eyes all said I had done it. With no one on my side, I had nowhere I could run. I turned to that boy and tried to admit what I had guilty, not guilty, done. Guilty, guilty, guilty. That's when it happened. Objection! Young Edgeworth appears and points. This so-called class trial is a disgrace! What do you mean, Miles? Yeah, he stole your money! You amateurs, your accusations make no sense. Could my own classmates really be this dense? Your honor, if I may, in right defense. Well, did you take my money? No, no I didn't! All that matters in this court is decisive evidence. 
You should all be ashamed of yourselves. I remember it so clearly even after all these years. You call this mob mentality a jury of his peers. The way the light of righteousness was blazing in his eyes. A trial without proof is where justice dies. The jury of kids exchanged looks. But it was him. Thief. Yeah, he did it. He's the one. We don't need proof. Crimes can't be undone. I told you, I didn't do it. Take him down. Oh, shut up. It's young Larry. If he says he didn't do it, then he didn't do it. Did you even stop to think about how he feels? Give it a rest. The jury of kids grumble and fade away. They listen to Larry, though. Maybe Edgeworth used too many big words. So the teacher replaced the money herself, and the three of us were friends from that point on. Wow, Mr. Edgeworth really did that for you? It doesn't sound anything like him. Even as the victim, he let Mercy take the lead. So how can I now turn my back when he's the one in need? No, I'll defend the demon, cause it's the least that he deserves. I'll fight for him, like he fought for me, until justice is served. That's so sweet of you, buddy. Leave it to me to save the day, am I right? Larry's phone rings, and he immediately disengages. Whoa! Sorry, Nick. Hey, Angel Baby, how's it hanging? What? W wait, Baby, don't be like that! Larry walks off stage. Phoenix rolls his eyes. When something smells. So you really decided to become a defense attorney because of that? Because of him? Weren't you, like, nine? It's the most alone I've ever felt. No one should have to go through that. Ever. Yeah. He moved away a few months later, and we lost touch. When I heard he'd become a prosecutor, I was shocked, and I thought, well, he'd have to face me if I were a defense attorney. Maya stares at him with a mixture of awe and amusement, and perhaps concern. My academic advisor gave me the same look. <laughs> they laugh at the absurdity <laughs> of it all. You've done a lot for him. It's sweet. And... I can see why you trust him so much. But, Nick, people change. You're tearing me apart, Angel! Sometimes. Come on, we've got to keep investigating. Gumshoe enters, so wrapped up in using his metal detector that he doesn't realize Phoenix and Maya are there, until Phoenix turns around and sees the metal detector pointing in his face. Oh, <laughs> there you are. I've been looking all over for you. He scans Phoenix's face some more. You know, you need more iron in your diet, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, despite herself, laughs at Gumshoe's joke. Phoenix pushes the metal detector down. I don't think scanning a person is going to help you much, detective. <sighs> you never know, pal. You could have been bugged. I'm not supposed to be sharing this stuff, see? Uh, but for Mr. Edgeworth... Gumshoe glances around, then passes a file folder to Maya in the most obvious covert handoff imaginable. Score! You're not going to get in trouble for sharing this with us, are you? Well, I already have a reputation for, uh, losing things. Looks like they have two witnesses. A photographer named Lotta Hart and... the boat shop caretaker? That old guy's a witness? Lotta Hart? Maya hands Phoenix the report and he begins leafing through. But why is he just the boat shop caretaker? Shouldn't the police know who he is? We're at a loss, pal. Nobody knows his name, and he's got no records or IDs anywhere. He must have had some rough jobs before this one, though, because we can't even get a good fingerprint off him. We don't know any more than you. Phoenix reads off the page. Around midnight last night, the victim was shot point-blank in the heart and died instantly. The body has been identified as... Phoenix stops and steps back in shock. Nick? Are you alright? Maya, it's Marvin Grossberg. What? Mr. Grossberg? How? Why? She snatches the report back from Phoenix and flips through it hastily. You two know him? He was Mia Fey's mentor. But what does he have to do with Edgeworth? They found his diary. 
As Maya reads, Grossberg appears in a spotlight apart from the others on stage and recites his diary entry. December 24th, 2016. Tonight, Tonight I, I leave, leave with, with great, great purpose. purpose. To meet with an old acquaintance on Gord Lake. I don't know if I can ever fully atone for those I have wronged in the days of my youth. But now that Red White is behind bars, I have finally been granted the freedom to try. I owe it to my dear departed protege, to her mother, and to all whom I harmed with my foolishness and greed. Even still, can my sins in the DL6 case ever be forgiven? The spotlight fades, and Grossberg disappears. DL6? What does Mr. Grossberg have to do with DL6? <gasps> Sis might know! I've gotta channel my sister! She shoves the folder back into Gumshoe's hands. Maya, don't you need more training? Well, I channeled her when it was really important, and she knows more about Mr. Grossberg than anyone. I just need to focus. Here we go. Phoenix backs up and gestures for Gumshoe to do the same. Maya performs a ritual with her Magatama and concentrates. With no apparent effect. I is she getting better reception on a channel yet? Ugh, this is... We need to talk to Mr. Edgeworth now! Maya! Maya rushes off stage with Phoenix in pursuit. Wait, you guys! There's more case info! He exits after them. Blackout. Scene 5. Back in the detention center. Maya paces in the visitor's room anxiously. A moment later, Edgeworth enters the visitor's cell, flanked by Maggie. Maya immediately goes to stand in front of the visitor's chair. Mr. Edgeworth, what does Mr. Grossberg have to do with- <laughs> If Wright thinks that having his assistant interrogate me will- This isn't about Nick! And frankly, it's not about you, either! If you don't want our help, then fine. But you don't just get to sit there and pretend like none of this is happening! She slams her hands down on the desk. What do you know about the DL6 incident? What do you know about the DL6 incident? Why can you never give a straight answer? <sighs> DL6 was the murder case that the police enlisted my mother to solve. She channeled the victim, and he told the police who killed him. But the suspect was found not guilty. Everyone in the country called her a fraud, and now she's gone. So, that spirit medium... Was your mother? You do know something! Please, I need to know what happened to her! Why did they lose the case? Why did they blame her? Edgeworth hesitates. I... <sighs> Maya softens. <sighs> Mr. Edgeworth, please. I just want the truth. Justice! Isn't that what you're supposed to do as a prosecutor? Fight for great justice? There's a flicker of recognition in Edgeworth's face and he gives a small smile. For great justice. <laughs> or, I guess, that's the, the steel, steel samurai. samurai. I'm well aware. They almost laugh in spite of everything. Edgeworth's smile drops. All these years, I thought I was the only one who had suffered. Miss Fay. Phoenix I... suddenly enters with gumshoe in tow. Maya, there you are. Edgeworth puts his defenses back up. Ah, right. I'm glad you've returned. It seems I require your assistance after all. What, Maya? It, did you- Sit down. Right. Edgeworth exchanges a meaningful look with Maya. It would not be fair for me to keep my secrets any longer. I'll tell you about DL6. It was a hugely public murder case, 15 years ago. Everyone was certain that the defendant was guilty. And yet, defense attorney Marvin Grossberg won the case by exposing some of the investigation methods used by the police. Exposing? Do you mean- Mr. Grossberg was the one that told the press about Mom? He told Red White, to be exact. The scandal of the decade, launching Blue Corp into a news media empire. How could he do that? After that news story, everyone, even the village, they just drove her away. It seems we've both lost someone we loved in this case, Miss Fay. He turns his gaze away. The victim in DL6 was a defense attorney named Gregory 
Edgeworth. Edgeworth? My father. He was shot. Right in front of me. Phoenix and Maya are dumbfounded. I don't remember much from that time. A defense mechanism, perhaps. But after I watched Grossberg acquit the only one who could have done it, I promised myself I'd never let criminals escape justice again. That's why you left suddenly in grade school. I had no idea. Mr. Edgeworth, uh, I'm so sorry, sir. If I had known... I appreciate it, Detective, but I've preferred not to think about it. Until the red-white trial, when I heard Marvin Grossberg's name on that dossier. Well, regardless, I recently received a letter from Mr. Grossberg asking to meet me at the lake. I had figured he wanted to tie up loose ends, even make amends. After all, the statute of limitations for DL6 has almost expired. Statute of limitations? Yes. In two days' time, fifteen years from the incident, the case will be closed forever. So, you did meet with Grossberg last night? Yes. We took a boat out on the lake to speak privately. But I did not shoot him. What did happen then? I'm not sure. I remember gunshots, but... The others share glances. You don't have to say it. It's a dubious defense, even if it is the truth. But it's still the truth. Let me defend you, Edgeworth. I'll help too. Gumshoe passes out papers in a pen. <laughs> Took you long enough, pals. You three. I... I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. Just sign. He does. Then passes the paper to Phoenix for him to sign. Good thing you came around, Mr. Edgeworth. You don't want a state-appointed lawyer defending you against Mr. Von Karmer, after all. No. Edgeworth? What's wrong? Who's Von Karma? Scene 6. Lights shift. Spotlight on Von Karma, suddenly appearing from the shadows. I'm in charge of every trial. I'm always in full control. The judge merely has to smile. To say guilty is his only role. I sustain my own objections to win the courtroom war. None shall interfere with my perfect guilty score. If justice is blind, then I will guide her to declare everyone guilty. I simply cannot help to maintain my perfect record. I will do what I must. Place in court for truth, peace, order, or trust. My father's killer went free. He was the one who took me in. The only vacation in his 40-year career was spent formalizing the adoption. He made me the man I am today. Well, maybe he's planning to go easy on you. I've not lost a case in all my years. I bring these pitiful lawyers to tears. In prosecution, I have no peers. Manfred von Karma, perfection incarnate. Court is now in session for the trial of Mr. Miles Edgeworth. The defense is ready, Your Honor. Well, it appears the prosecution... Silence! I was taking a meaningful pause before speaking. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, do you have an opening statement? <laughs> of course. I raised Miles Edgeworth as one of my own, but I cannot be impeded by such sentimentality. Decisive evidence, a decisive witness, nothing else is required. For if justice is blind, then I will guide her to declare everyone guilty. I simply cannot help to maintain my perfect record. I will do what I must. No place 
him court for truth, peace, order, or trust. Your defendant will shortly be revealed in his deadly crime and sin. For my case against him is perfect, and I'll do anything to win. You know, a visit from Mia would be really nice right about now. I'm trying. I've been trying. Distinguished members of the court, just after midnight on December 25th, Miles Edgeworth shot Marvin Grossberg and dumped his body into Gord Lake. The defense has no opening statement, so I shall begin- Objection! I do have an opening statement. Wrong. Do not interrupt me again. Wh- what y- Yes, uh, he's quite right, of course. What? The police were called to the scene by the caretaker of a nearby boat shop. When they arrived, they discovered a body in the lake, a gun in one of the boats, and the defendant sitting in his car nearby. The ballistic markings from the bullet extracted from the heart of the victim match the pistol found at the scene. What are ballistic markings, Nick? They're like fingerprints for guns. Every gun leaves a unique print on the bullet it fires. Silence! We do not have time for baby's first murder trial. The adults are talking. Phoenix and Maya freeze like kids caught whispering during class. Fingerprints were discovered on the pistol. From the defendant's right hand. The crowd bursts into chatter. Phoenix in disbelief rounds on Edgeworth. Your prints were on the gun? I think we've established that. Your prints were on the gun? I was in a daze! Order! I shall have order in my court. With a stomp of Von Karma's cane, the crowd instantly falls silent. Now. I will call one witness to the stand whose testimony will prove Miles Edgeworth's guilt. Then, Your Honor, you will bang your gavel and end this trial. Yes, sir. The crowd starts to chatter once more. I thought Detective Gumshoe said that there were two witnesses. The boat shop caretaker and... I call Lotta Hart to the stand. Lotta makes her way to the witness stand, all smiles, setting down a camera and microphone attachment on a tripod facing the defense's bench. Wait a minute. I know you. You were Red White's secretary. At the mention of Red's name, the crowd starts murmuring suspiciously. Order! Von Karma bangs his cane, setting off the camera flash, causing Phoenix to flinch. Lada shuts her camera off. Nah, I left all that secretary business behind me months ago. Now I spend my time with my trusty camera and microphone here. It's set to go off for any loud, sharp noise, so I can snap up that lake monster everyone's talking about. The prosecution submits these two photos of the lake, taken automatically at the moment of each gunshot. As you can see, they both show two men in the boat, one of whom is holding a gun. They capture the moment of the murder. The crowd murmurs more. This time, the judge bangs his gavel to silence them. Order! The court accepts these photos as evidence. Frankly, I'm quite convinced of the defendant's guilt. Hold it! I demand to cross-examine the witness. We have yet to hear her testimony in her own words. (sighs) I grow tired of these wastes of time, but if you must... Y'all need to loosen up. You're so tense and serious. This ain't a funeral. It's close enough, isn't it? It's a murder trial. Y'all need to learn some manners, too. It ain't polite to talk like that to a young lady. Witness, don't say anything trivial or unrelated to this case. Understand? Y- yeah yeah I understand. Y'all listen up now and listen good, cause what I'm about to say is true. Cause what I saw is what happened, and this is what that killer to do. I was camping by the lake in my car that Christmas Eve. I reckon it was past midnight when I heard a, a big bang pow and I looked around only to see the absurd. Two gents in a boat, the only thin on the lake, not an airy thin around that I could see. There was another bang and not a dang thing could have done what I saw there be. Witness, you're saying you saw the murder take place? Sure did. Y'all listen good now. I heard two dang gunshots that night. When I heard the first shot, I looked out at that boat. Then there was another flash and someone fell into the water. Hold it! 
Miss Lotta, you gotta be lying. It couldn't have been that way, y'all. If you reckon it was past midnight, that means it was Christmas Day. Ha! Objection! Irrelevant! The defense is out of hand. The witness merely misspoke the date. Her testimony still stands. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. When you looked at the lake, could you clearly see the men? Ain't the photo proof enough for you? Uh, no, it isn't. I'm asking if you saw them. Objection! This tells us nothing new. Were you looking at the lake when you heard the second shot? Sure, I guess I was. Were you or were you not? Enough! I think we've heard all we need to hear. Judge! I am ready to hand down a verdict. No! Mr. Wright, I will have to penalize any further outbursts by holding you in contempt of court. Nick! This court hereby finds the defendant... Hold it! Uh, who was that? It... was me! Maya, what are you... Lada, your testimony's real strange. Is it possible to see anyone in that range? You're being unclear about what you saw. How do you account for this flaw? Did you even see it worth that all? Objection! Hey, Enough what's of the big this. idea? Nonsense! Judge, declare the criminal? defense in I contempt of court. I swear, now! I saw Edward. Very well. You have been warned. Bailiff, please remove Mr. Wright from the courtroom. No, wait! Please, it was me who spoke out. Nick didn't do anything! Very well. Bailiff, remove Miss Faye from the courtroom. Maya! You're almost there, you two! The truth's in sight! Miss Faye? Wait a minute. Truth in sight. Sight! Of course! Your Honor, please. Did you hear what Miss Hart just said? She said she clearly saw Mr. Edgeworth. This wasn't in her testimony before. This means she has a new testimony, and I have a right to cross-examine her again. Objection. Pathetic. It's too late for baseless claims. The girl's already paid the price. Say one more word, you'll get the same. Judge, continue with your verdict. I'm sorry, but I cannot. What? Mr. Wright is correct. The defense may cross-examine the witness once more. This is still a court of law, Mr. Von Karma. Ah, listen well, Mr. Wright. I will not tolerate further badgering of my witness. Miss Hart, could you please repeat your testimony? The man on the boat was Edgeworth. His photo is my proof. I saw him clear as day, and I swear I'm telling the truth. You claim this is significant? Then enlighten us. I saw all. what I saw. That's it? I heard what I heard. There's nothing I can I see. May say Hold a on. Lot of things, That's it. I mean it's right in front of word. me. Objection! Gotcha, Miss Hart. These photos show us the lake was incredibly foggy that night, and you were camping quite a distance away from the shore. And yet, you're positive you could identify Edgeworth, or anyone, in that boat. You calling me a liar? Well, if the boot fits. Oh, you're cruising for a boot to the head, Spocky! Miss Hart! If you really saw Edgeworth, why haven't you mentioned the other man in the boat? Marvin Grossberg, your other former boss. What? Grodyberg kicked the bucket? The courtroom is silent. Von Karma massages his temples and Phoenix grins. Lotta realizes her mistake. Uh, all right, all right. I guess I couldn't really see Edgeworth for sure. But I didn't mean to lie, honest. It was just all so exciting being a real-life witness. But wait, I can make it up to y'all. I got something else to show you. No, you don't. The prosecution has nothing more to present at this time. Well, I do. I've got another photo. Don't look like much, but it might be important, I reckon. Before Von Karma can stop her, Lotta shows her photo. It's the same shot of the lake as her previous two photos, only without the boat. Hmm. It's just a plain picture of the lake. The timestamp says it was taken at 11.50, almost 30 minutes before the murder. <laughs> you see why I tried to stop her? It's completely worthless to the court. But if there's nothing in the photo, what caused the camera to trigger it all? Clearly nothing that concerns this case. I'm inclined to agree. Miss Hart, you are free to go. What? But I want to see Baron Von Fancy Pants get his what fur. She gestures toward Von Karma. Leave. 
Lada falls silent, folds up her camera gear, and gives a motivational thumbs up to a frustrated Phoenix as Maggie leads her off stage. Well, if there's no one else for us to hear from, I see no reason to prolong this trial. But that's not true. There's one more witness that we have yet to hear from. The boat shop caretaker. Hmm. Prosecutor Von Karma. This caretaker is unfit to testify. He suffered a traumatic brain injury some years back and has lost, among other things, his long-term memory. How was two days ago long-term? Your Honor, he's obviously hiding- However, if the defense insists on wasting this court's time, I am, of course, prepared to question him. Wait, really? Very well. This court will take a brief recess to allow the prosecution to prepare its next witness. Everyone exits, except Phoenix and Edgeworth. Phoenix puts his head down on the defense's bench with a groan. Uh... The sound snaps Edgeworth back from being lost in thought. Well, don't put on a brave face just for me, right? Maya and Gumshoe enter the courtroom together, unnoticed by Phoenix. Uh, it's days like today I really wish Mia were here. Maya hears this and stops. Phoenix spots her and puts on a bit of forced cheer. Maya! Hi, Nick. Did you do it? Did you win? Well, we didn't lose. He turns the smile meaningfully to Edgeworth. Edgeworth? He discreetly motions toward Maya. Ah, uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> that was an irresponsible and foolish thing you did, Miss Fay. An assistant is of no use if they're kicked out of court. Maya steals her face and flees the scene, as Phoenix and Gumshoe look on, completely stunned. Edgeworth, on a roll, doesn't notice Maya's exit. Not to mention the danger to your future! Edgeworth. A false accusation can be explained away, but how do you expect to find a job with a second arrest on your file? You simply- Edgeworth! Edgeworth belatedly turns around, seeing Maya is gone. Wait, pal! Uh, no one's made your bail yet! I thought you were an eloquent speaker. Uh, uh, I didn't... Hmm... He quickly takes out an elegant checkbook and writes a check, handing it to Gumshoe. Here. This should cover her bail. You got it, sir! I'll get it to the detention center right away! And I'll go find her, pals! Don't you worry! Very well, detective. Uh, please tell her... Tell her... I know what to say. You can trust me, pal. Gumshoe takes off quickly in the direction Maya left. Edgeworth sits back in the defendant's chair, seemingly distracted. Edgeworth, listen. I know this is a tough case, but as long as you have faith in me and tell me everything you can remember, we will get to the bottom of this. Of course. Everything I remember. Blackout. Scene 7. People park outside. Maya is performing her channeling ritual, unsuccessfully. She flops down dejectedly with a sigh, then tries again after a moment, holding the Magatama close to her heart. Head up, back straight, while you're staring down your feet. Stand your ground. Don't back down, you won't crack under the weight. I'm sorry, Nick, but I can see that you need me uh, now, not me. So, why should I stay? <laughs> As Maya sits crying, Gumshoe enters, speaking on the phone with Maggie. Yeah, I know, Maggie. But something's come up. Can you cover for me? <gasps> You're the best, Maggie. Talk to you later. Gumshoe approaches Maya. Hey, uh, Miss Faye? D detective you shouldn't have come. 
You have better things to do, like solve the case. Without me. Oh, don't be like that, pal. You've helped out a bunch. Uh, Mr. Edgeworth was just trying to thank you, you know. He's sure got a funny way of showing it. He paid your bail for you, pal. That's gonna mean something. He did? But he said I was irresponsible and foolish. <laughs> oh, no, pal. He doesn't think that. See, you just have to learn to speak Mr. Edgeworth's language. Like when he says, I should duck your pay, detective. What he means is, I know you can do better, Dick. And when he says, get out and leave me alone. What he's trying to say is, I'm feeling really down and could use some extra support. He sits next to Maya. And when he says, you're irresponsible and foolish. What he means to say is, thanks for sticking your neck out for me, pal. Good to know I'm appreciated even though I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I get you, pal. But it's not about having all the answers. Sometimes all you need is somebody by your side. Somebody you can trust. And if that's what you want to be, I'd say you're doing a damn good job already. Thank you, Detective. I guess we should go back and wait for Nick, huh? Well, hang on a second, pal. I mean... We're not too far from the lake, and the caretaker's called in as a witness right now. So while he's gone... He mischievously pulls out the metal detector from his coat. Why don't you and I go inspect every suspicious-looking nook and cranny of that boat shop? Maya returns a mischievous smile, and the two head off towards the boat shop. Scene 8, back in the courtroom. The caretaker is capering. Everyone else looks annoyed, frustrated, or exhausted. Oh, pasta shop, pasta everywhere. Pasta shop, pasta in your hair. Witness, we've been through this. Please stick to the case. Yes, sir, I, you know, I think I lost my place. <sighs> you said you saw someone bringing a boat back from the lake. I remember, yes, I saw that fluttery man and no mistake. He was talking to himself and I remember what he said over and over, uttering, I can't believe he's dead. And you are certain it was the defendant? Yesterday is hazy, ten years ago. But it's what's in that it's worth boy and I know that for sure. The crowd explodes into discussion. This time Von Karma just smirks, and the judge, after a moment of confusion, actually has to use his gavel. Order! Order in the court! Mr uh, Witness, I am impressed by the lucidity of your testimony. Thankfully, the witness's short-term memory remains intact. There is no need for a cross-examination. What? But if he were lying- OBJECTION! I will not have my witness be needlessly slandered. In a court of law, evidence is everything. And you, Mr. Wright, have nothing. Phoenix desperately looks through his evidence and turns up nothing. No. No! Judge, I demand you give your verdict. Now. Uh, very well. This court finds the defendant, Mr. Miles Hetchworth, guilty. The accused will surrender to the court immediately to be held pending his sentencing. That is all. Court is adjourned. But just as the judge lifts his gavel to adjourn the court... Wait! Uh, objection! Wait, 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 wait! Larry bursts out of the crowd and runs to the witness stand tripping and stumbling on the way there. Ah, no! I have to testify! Ah. L Larry, ah. what are you doing? Your Honor, dismiss this man. You have already declared- But I was there! I was at the lake that night, just like that guy! And hearing him testify, I realized I heard the gunshot! You're done questioning him? Well, I'm here, completely questionable. Um, this has never happened before. 
I'm not sure what the proper procedures are to follow. There are no proper procedures. The trial has ended. Your Honor, these are lives we are dealing with. To ignore any evidence would be a horrible distortion of justice. There is a tense beat as the judge considers this. I agree with the defense. If Mr. Edgeworth is in fact guilty, this testimony will not change that fact. We will hear it. Von Karma, for the first time, looks uneasy. Right. This could be our chance. Von Karma plans out his trials to the last detail, but this! There's no way he could have planned for this. He's worried. Of course he's worried. It's Larry. I'm worried. Witness, please state your name and occupation. Larry Butts, uh, ladies man. This is a colossal waste of time. Mr. Butts, please begin your testimony. You got it, Pops. Well, I was hanging out with my girlfriend Ruth in my mansion with the golden picket fence. Sir, must I remind you not to please tell the truth because perjury is a criminal offense. Whoa, sorry, let me try that again. See, I was all alone because I'd just been dumped. And I know that isn't easy to believe. Out by the lake where I was selling some junk, it was my only company that Christmas Eve. But as I boarded up and locked up my shop, I heard a gunfire with a noisy pop. And I know you don't think my opinion counts for a whole lot, but let me guarantee you that I heard that shot. That's how it all happened, I recall it clear as day, so believe me even if you think I'm nuts. His testimony's vague. And you know just what they say when something smells. It's usually the butts. This witness is contributing nothing. I demand he be dismissed and ideally drawn and quartered. Hold it! Larry, there is one thing that sounds out of place in your testimony. And what's that, Nick? Well, you say you heard a gunshot. Earlier, Miss Lotta Hart testified, and I quote, Y'all listen good now, I heard two dang gunshots that night. Nick, you said Miss and not Mrs., right? Because if she's available... Larry, just tell me why you didn't hear the second gunshot. Truth is that I was listening on my headphones, because radio's the friend that's always there. I like to jam out when I'm feeling alone So I may have missed a shot that filled the air But I remember that one bang that I heard The DJ was talking when it occurred So I know it wasn't something like a killer drum and riff But I can guarantee you that I was scared stiff When the DJ had talked there was hardly any noise So I listened in awe of her really sexy voice It was pure and demure yet mature and so refined I can't get that lovely voice out of my mind That's how it all happened I recall it plain as ink And again up here it took a lot of guts Ah! Or to be more succinct This whole testimony stinks And and when something something smells it's probably the butts I can't stand to listen to this lad This young man has nothing new to add Larry, there's just one thing I should know When you listen to the radio In regards to the DJ, what exactly did she say on that show? Do you know? I... I remember. She said, Hey, it's almost Christmas! Well, Mr. Wright, anything to add? Um, as compelling as your argument is, I demand that the witness end this pointless charade. Now! Oh, very well. Mr. Larry Butts, you are now dismissed. Objection! Your Honor, please. I just realized that Larry's testimony changes everything. If you recall, Miss Lada's camera went off at 12.15, December 25th. Yes, yes. And though the witness is incompetent. And frankly, quite a dope. I know this shaky testimony's not a myth. Guys, come on! And though we all assume the gunfire twice, in fact, the murder weapon fired thrice. One was fired Christmas Eve, the other's Christmas Day, and these three photos illustrate my repartee. See? One from when the camera went off at 11.50 p.m. Almost Christmas! And two more at 12.15. The camera caught three snapshots for three gunshots, and Larry's testimony proves it. Why, you're absolutely right. No objections, Mr. Von Karma? (sighs) Very well, then. The question is, what happened in this 25-minute gap? Indeed. We must look into this matter further. 
Mr. Butts, your final thoughts? Get that man on the stand, and shout that no disgrace. It's in prime how you time for you prosecuting him. I think that you could, could, could even get a decree, or it's worse to fill the prison for life. That's how it all happened, and that's all I gotta say. I recall it just like it was yesterday. It was Tuesday. And so I saved the day, even though I'm just a blood. When something smells, it's gotta be. That man needs a lobotomy. When something smells, it's gotta be the boss. That's right. It's gotta be the boss. Get him out of here. Atcha. Larry knee slides out of the courtroom, or something equally epic. Your Honor, the relevance of Larry's testimony cannot be denied. There were 25 minutes between the first gunshot and the murder witnessed by Miss Hart. More than enough time for the real killer to dispose of the body and stage a crime scene. So, you've invented a real killer. How utterly desperate. Mr. Wright, who would this real killer be? The only person with unlimited access to the crime scene. The boat shop caretaker. He lured Grossberg to his shop, shot him, and threw the body into the lake. Yeah. No, he he then met with Edgeworth, in disguise as Marvin Grossberg. Once they were out on the lake, the caretaker fired the gun twice. One to create a witness, and one for the murder itself. Finally, he jumped in the water and swam back to the boat shop, framing Edgeworth for the crime. What a ludicrous story. But you can't rule out the possibility, can you? Not without questioning the caretaker further. Hmm. I agree. I would like to hear from your witness again, Prosecutor Von Karma. <clears throat> yes, Your Honor. Bailiff? Yes, sir. Maggie exits to fetch the witness. While we are waiting, I have some questions for the defendant. Mr. Edgeworth, you heard the testimony? How could I have possibly missed it, Your Honor? Indeed, what Wright has concluded is... logical. Do you have to sound so surprised? Suddenly, Maggie bursts back into the courtroom. Uh, Your Honor, sir! The, the witness! He's disappeared! What? The officers at the lake says he's not at the boat shop either. Mr. Von Karma! As this has been happening, Von Karma has taken a piece of paper from his files, signed it, and handed it to Maggie. A warrant has already been issued. Good. Well then, it goes without saying that I cannot declare a verdict under these circumstances. I request that the police department utilize all its forces to find that witness. Am I understood? Maggie salutes and heads out. Very well. Court is adjourned until tomorrow. Everyone exits, except Phoenix and Edgeworth, who are quickly joined by Larry. I can't believe we got out of that unscathed. Thanks to my awesome performance! Ah, oh, man. It's been forever since it's just been the three of us against the world. Right, Edgy? He puts an arm around Edgeworth's shoulder, who shrugs it off and begins distractedly pacing. Ah, oh, come on! I had him swooning in the aisles. I do remember feeling faint. We're just a bunch of heroes, aren't we? I mean, you saved me, you're saving him, I saved both of you, and way back when, he saved you! Phoenix clears his throat, embarrassed. <clears throat> he sees Edgeworth is distraught. Hey, Larry, um... Larry, for once, reads the room. Uh, yeah. So, anyway... I got it, Jet. You two take it sleazy. I'm gonna go ask out the future Mrs. Lotta Butts. He exits with a series of nonverbal signals for Phoenix to talk to Edgeworth. Phoenix shoes him off, then approaches Edgeworth cautiously. Edgeworth, are you okay? I... I need to tell you about something. It's been weighing heavily on my mind, and I... I need to get it off my chest. Yes? It's a nightmare I've been having. Recurring and remarkably consistent. I believe it may be a memory of a crime that I committed. A memory 
of a murder. Blackout. Scene 9. The Boat Shop. Outside, Maya knocks on the front door. No reply. She tries the door, and it's unlocked. She and Gumshoe enter. It is empty and sparse, save for Polly on her perch. Gumshoe scans everything in sight with the metal detector. Hello? Anybody here? Hello? Anybody here? <laughs> Maya rushes to Polly. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, you must be so lonely. Hmm. No sign of where he might have gone. I hope he remembered to water his parrot. Suddenly, Gumshoe's metal detector beeps. It's reacting to something underneath a cloth on a small side table. Gumshoe pulls it off. It's a high-tech safe, in clear contrast to its surroundings. Uh-huh. This must be where he keeps his secret pasta recipes. Maya fiddles with the safe, without success. They didn't, like, teach you how to code break in detective school by chance, did they? <laughs> Sorry, pal. That parrot over there has a better chance of opening this thing than I do. <laughs> hey, Polly, what's the safe combination? One, two, two, eight, four. Maya and Gumshoe throw each other a look before Maya punches in the code. It works. Whoa. All right then, but be careful, pal. Maya opens the safe, and as they peek inside, Phoenix bursts through the door, startling them. Ah! Ah! Gumshoe? Maya, are you all right? Maya walks over to Phoenix. Gumshoe lets them have their moment and looks thoroughly through the safe. Yeah, I'm okay. Maya, Edgeworth wasn't trying to hurt your feelings. He's just not good with people. I noticed. Why'd you come here, though? Shouldn't you be investigating? I am. This caretaker is suspect numero uno. Him? Uh-huh. Found something. Gumshoe pulls an envelope out of the safe, handing it to Maya. Jeez, whoever wrote this must be meticulous. This handwriting is practically perfect. She opens the envelope, pulling out a letter. She hands the envelope to Phoenix, who reads the front as Maya reads on. It's addressed to Why Why. Get your revenge on... Marvin Grossberg and Miles Edgeworth? What? This is your last chance. Now is the time to get revenge on the two men who ruined your life. This, it looks like a list of instructions. How to kill Mr. Grossberg and frame Mr. Edgeworth for it. Phoenix reads over Maya's shoulder. Write to Grossberg. Kill him. Get Edgeworth in a boat. Two gunshots? I can't believe this. This is exactly what I laid out in court today. Whoa. You figured that out? So that's it. This why why guy is the real killer, pal. This is just what we need to save Mr. Edgeworth. But it's not enough. We have to prove that the caretaker is why why and that he actually did what the letter said. And why this guy wanted revenge on Mr. Grossberg and Mr. Edgeworth to begin with. It must have something to do with DL6. That's the only connection between the two of them. If that's the case, pal... I think I know where we can find out more. Gumshoe gestures for them to leave. He exits with Phoenix close behind. Maya is almost out the door herself when she suddenly turns around. Oh, Polly! I'll come back to visit you later, okay? I won't forget! She exits. We sit with Polly for an extra beat. Ah, don't forget! DL6! Ah. Blackout. Scene 10. Outside the records room in the criminal affairs department. Gumshoe looks around stealthily, then ushers Phoenix and Maya by quietly. Now remember, the records room ain't open for civilians. You gotta lay low. He swipes the door with his ID card and the door unlocks. Gotcha! Go find the evidence you need, pals. I'll stand guard and make sure no one sees you. Thank you so much, Detective Gumshoe. We're really grateful. No time for that, pal. Now go! Investigate! Learn! He shoos them into the records room, and with a last, 
for Mr. Edgeworth! He slams the door shut. Why don't you have as much energy as Detective Gumshoe, Nick? I used to, until I took up some babysitting on the side. Hey. She elbows him. He smiles. Maya takes the joke more seriously than she lets on. Come on, let's go find that file. As they go look, lights shift to Gumshoe outside the door. Maggie and other police officers run by. She spots Gumshoe and drags him along with her. Dick! They found the caretaker! Let's bring him in! Oh, uh, Maggie, uh, uh... The police exit as lights shift back to Phoenix and Maya. She opens a drawer. Found it! Unsolved case number DL6. Nick, it's empty! Wh- what so creepy. There's just a couple loose papers and a big empty box where the evidence should be. Phoenix takes the pages and reads the headings. Suspect data, case summary, state versus Yanni Yogi. Why, why? That's him! Phoenix bullet points for Maya as he reads on. DL6, December 28th, 2001. The district courthouse. An earthquake knocked out the power and three people were trapped in an elevator. Attorney Gregory Edgeworth, his son Miles, and bailiff Yanni Yogi. Grossberg argued that Yogi suffered temporary insanity due to brain damage from the lack of oxygen, so he couldn't be held liable for killing Gregory. Yogi's fiance at the time left him soon after the incident. Maya takes out the YY letter, handing it to Phoenix. But if Yogi was found not guilty, why would he want revenge? Maybe he blames Grossberg for... He suddenly stops, studying the letter intently. Nick? Phoenix searches for something in his briefcase. I've seen this handwriting before, I swear. He finds what he was looking for, scrutinizes it for a moment, and passes it to Maya. She looks it over and compares it to the letter. What is this? The search word for the caretaker? Wow, this is the exact same handwriting. Would you call it practically perfect? Maya and Phoenix exchange the same wide-eyed expression as they realize... What are you doing here? Yeah! Von Karma! You... Mr. Von Karma. This letter... It was you, wasn't it? You instructed Yanni Yogi to commit murder! Yanni Yogi... How many years has it been since I heard that name? Now it appears, Mr. Wright, you've grown wise to my game. So you and He's such a he fool. Wrote this letter. Yes, my dear defense attorney. And I must thank you. Bringing it here saved me a great deal of needless hassle. He reaches for the letter, but Phoenix pulls away. Uh, hmm. You should know, I do not negotiate with defense attorneys. They're like bugs to me. Worthless things. To be crushed. Von Karma pulls something out of his pocket and approaches Phoenix and Maya. Nick, what is that thing? A stun gun. For self-defense. Usually. Oh, and how arduous I thought this process would be. And yet you stand here, so render that letter to me. This trial is ending, now your life's depending on lending that parchment you see. Maya, don't get any closer. No, Von Karma, no, sir. We won't let you stand in our way. We both know Miles Edgeworth is innocent. This meeting won't lead us astray. These last 15 long years for vengeance I've waited, hoped, anticipated the payback I seek. Those who would mar me must face their subjection, as without reflection I punish the weak. But Edgeworth... Ha! A pitiful, second-rate romanticist. Just like his father. His father. Oh, that cockroach! Only he would dare defy me! Defy you? You mean- I faced him in court. I crushed him in court. But he scored a single blow. A single penalty. The only one in my career. He scarred my perfection, and I will have my revenge. His son will feel my wrath. All the rage that's been building tenfold! 
Now 600,000 folks will go straight to your face. The for the truth will emerge. The verdict will not usually die, though you might feel some pain. You ought to know better, so hand me that letter, lest you watch this child be slain. Enough of this. Give me that letter. Now! No! My Elise at Von Karma. She grapples with him, making him drop a small plastic bag without him noticing. Run! Uh, idiot girl, what do you think you're doing? Maya collapses. Maya! Maya! <sighs> now, where were we? If you'll excuse me, I'll leave with this missive. I won't abuse thee long as your submissive. Like Yogi and Grossberg, each one was a pawn. Now I'll take that letter, and with that I'm gone. I can't let you do that, Von Karma. Foolish fool. I will not let you deter me any longer. Out of my way! <laughs> Phoenix collapses. <sighs> Von Karma takes the letter from Phoenix's grip. See you in court, Mr. Wright. He turns to leave, but then turns back around, stuns Phoenix into unconsciousness, then exits. Lights dim. Scene 11. Time passes. Lights up as Phoenix finally stirs. He remembers what happened, and, with little regard for his own injuries, immediately reaches over to Maya. Maya! Maya, are you okay? Maya, please get up. Open your eyes. Nick? Maya! Oh, thank God you're okay. I thought that- The letter! Did he take it? Well, yes, but that doesn't matter now. I'm just glad you're okay. What are we going to do? That letter was the key to the whole case! I... I don't know. But we know the truth now. If we just turn our thinking around, there has to be another way to prove it. There has to be. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. Maybe if we tried to run away, we'd still have the letter. Maya, it's okay. No, Nick! It's not okay! I'm not okay! Every time I try to help, I just make things worse, and you... I know you wish I was Mia instead. Maya, I... I am so sorry I made you feel that way. I do miss Mia. A lot. But I am so glad you're here. I wouldn't have gotten this far without you. We would have lost today if you hadn't confronted Lada. I freeze sometimes. I panic. But you, you're always pushing ahead. You're amazing. Nick. Thank you, Maya. I should have said it sooner. Thank you for being here. For being you. You know, I wish Mia were here too. Maya. But I believe in us. I believe in you. She would too. Yeah. I know we can do this. We have to. Phoenix notices the dropped plastic bag. Wait. What's this? He picks it up and reads the label. DL6 incident, evidence number 7, bullet from the heart of Gregory Edgeworth. Von Karma was holding this when you jumped him! Maya! He helps Maya stand. In darkest times you show no fear, you stand up to lend me your light. I don't know how we'll save the day, but now thanks to you, we'll find a way. For no one finds quite like a thing. And the truth must be inside. Lights shift to Edgeworth sitting alone in his detention cell. Tomorrow's trial, my sentence is decided. The truth brought to light, I've run out of time. At last.
must I answer for my crime? Tomorrow's trial. Tomorrow at last this comes to an end. Tomorrow I swear I'll defend my friend. Tomorrow at last it's out of my hands. I'm telling you right. You don't understand. This is my penance. This is what I deserve. I will not rest until I see justice served. Tomorrow, at last, at last. Add spotlights on Gumshoe and Maya. Only one day left to go, our time is running short. I won't give I won't up, submit, he didn't, didn't commit a crime of any sort. I won't I'll give stay in. up all night reading files, but I know what I'm gonna say. I'll, I'll fight till the truth comes to light on this final day. This is the end for me. I won't give up the fight. I dread what lies ahead, but I'll do what's right. Everyone exits. Lights shift to the next morning in the courtroom. Gumshoe, Lada, Larry, and the police join the crowd in the gallery. Convict a prosecutor Was Mr. Edgeworth just a witness Or was he the shooter? We've given you the facts We've done all we can do We've all got your back, Nick Now it's all up to you It's the last the day final I will win. It's taken 15 years, but it was worth the wait. I know I must stand alone to face my fate. Together we'll face this. Through reveal the unknown. It's far from over, and you're far from alone. is back in session for the trial of Mr. Miles Hetchworth. The prosecution is perfectly prepared, and the defense... Can speak for itself. We are ready, Your Honor. Last night, the police were able to find the witness they carelessly misplaced. It seems our detective is so worthless he failed to tell the witness he had to stay in the courthouse. Phoenix takes a deep breath and straightens his shoulders. Your Honor, I demand the witness take the stand and state his name for the court. Objection! Need I remind you this witness cannot remember his name? While his short-term memory is intact, his long-term memory... Is also intact. Your Honor, he remembers everything about his past, and he has a motive for this murder. As Phoenix points at the caretaker sitting in the crowd, the rest of the crowd murmurs confusedly. A bold claim, Mr. Wright. If you are certain of the caretaker's identity, who is he? The caretaker is none other than Yanni Yogi, a former court bailiff and the defendant in the DL6 incident. The murder in the courthouse elevator? But how can you be so certain? He cannot be, Your Honor. 
The defense has no evidence, no one to testify. He might as well cross-examine the witness's parrot for comic relief. (laughs) Very funny, Von Karma, but we're not going to... Phoenix trails off, inspiration striking him. Nick? Right, tell me you're not... Hold it! Your Honor, the defense would like to take Mr. Von Karma up on his proposal. What proposal? The defense requests to cross-examine the witness's parrot. The crowd goes into an incredulous frenzy. The judge bangs his gavel to no avail. You can't do that! This is a mockery of the judicial system! What are you gonna do? Cut my pay? Absolutely! Order! I said order! Um... What do you think, Mr. Von Karma? Do you even need to ask? But if you are really that foolhardy, be my guest. Phoenix confidently points. Let the parrot take the stand. Just wake me up when this catastrophe is over. Indeed. Bailiff, bring in the bird. Maggie exits. Nick, what are you thinking? It's all right, Maya. You'll see. Maggie enters with Polly and sets her on the witness stand. The caretaker sits and watches. My, that's quite the bird. Does it have a name? Polly doesn't respond, but looks around. Hello? She pecks the stand. Mr. Wright, this witness is ignoring me. Um, will the witness please testify? No response. Maya, she talked to you. Can you get her to answer? Um, okay. Polly, Polly, what's your name? Polly, Polly! The witness's name is Polly. Yes, I believe she established that. The defense has one more question for the witness, Your Honor. Maya? Polly, Polly, what's the safe combination? One, two, two, eight! Your Honor, here is your proof that the caretaker is Yanni Yogi. I submit to the court record the DL6 case file. He hands the file to Maggie, who hands it to the judge. Yanni Yogi had a fiancé who left him when he was arrested for the DL6 incident, which occurred on December 28th, 1228. Her name was Polly Jenkins. He named the parrot after her and set the safe combination to the date of DL6. Hmm. <laughs> That is quite a coincidence, but hardly conclusive. Indeed. Mr. Wright, it appears you lack definitive evidence to link this man to the DL6 case. What? No! We're so close, it can't end here! There's gotta be something else we can use! Ah, What are we forgetting? Ah, Don't forget! DL6! Enough! I'm done with this! All of it! My name is Yanni Yogi, and I killed Marvin Grossberg all those years ago in that elevator. I was innocent, I swear, but no one, not even Grossberg, believed me. What are you doing? He claimed I had suffered brain damage. Father! He won the case, but I lost everything. Just think so. When a package arrived with a gun, and instructions on how to take my revenge on the two men who ruined my life. You suffered. I didn't care who sent it. I followed the orders happily. For my pasta shop, my will to live in drained pasta shop, leaving nothing to remain. I'm leaving nothing to remain. Yesterday burns clearly for 15 years. I can't forget. Holy, forgive me. Yet with all I've lost, it's just as well. Farewell, Asta Shop. 
I would rather be in hell. I have no regrets. There is nothing but stunned silence, until the judge says, Bailiff, please arrest this man. Maggie handcuffs Yogi. The silence continues as they and Polly exit. Edgeworth is shaken in thought. Well, Judge, what are you waiting for? Render your verdict. Very well. This court finds the defendant, Mr. Miles Edgeworth, not guilty. Maya, Gumshoe, and Larry shout for joy. <laughs> the crowd cheers. Phoenix is relieved. Edgeworth stands up, grasping himself tightly. That is all. Court is adjourned. But just as the judge raises his gavel... OBJECTION! <gasps> everyone is shocked, except for a grinning Von Karma. Maggie rushes back in as Edgeworth races to the center of the courtroom. Your Honor, I object to your judgment. I am not innocent at all. Mr. Edgeworth, what are you doing? Yanni Yogi killed Marvin Grossberg and framed me for revenge. But revenge for what? Objection! The verdict has already been passed. Objection! I recall a fool raising an objection yesterday after a verdict had been passed. Miles Edgeworth must be heard. Indeed. It is our duty to hear every witness out. Mr. Edgeworth, go ahead. Mr. Wright won't stop you. Yes, Your Honor. Edgeworth takes the witness stand. Phoenix straightens, looking through his files. He had feared this might happen. Yanni Yogi wanted revenge on the two men who ruined his life. Marvin Grossberg, who convinced him to plead insanity. And, I have just realized, on me. I didn't want to believe it, but if Yanni Yogi was not the killer in DL6, everything becomes perfectly clear. The murderer... The real criminal of the DL6 incident? It was me! Oh, never have we seen before a man who's been declared not guilty Turn around and ask for more, confessing to a different guilt He's admitted to his crime Order! I told you he was slime Order! He won't go free this time Order! The Order! Your Honor! I confess to the murder of Gregory Edgeworth The statute of limitations of which ends today Order! Order! I confess this incident is completely unprecedented. I'm not certain how to proceed. <coughs> it is simple, Your Honor. We hold a trial. Right here, right now. Very well. Is the prosecution prepared? Always, Your Honor. And the defense? I'm sorry, Wright. I've wasted all your effort. You don't need to stay. I need a moment to get my case ready, Your Honor. Nick! What case? Mr. Edgeworth's already confessed! I know. Edgeworth, I don't believe you. What? A nightmare isn't evidence. But this is. I'll prove your innocence. Trust me, I'm not giving up on you just yet. The defense is ready, Your Honor. Who killed Gregory Edgeworth with the son of himself? The case is set to expire today. If they don't solve it now, it'll die upon a shelf. Very well. Court is now in session for the trial of Mr. Miles Edgeworth. Fifteen years ago, you mistakenly killed your father, Gregory Edgeworth, in this very courthouse. Testify about this matter to the court. He's already confessed. What else is there to say? He killed Gregory Edgeworth. Shh! That day, I had gone to the courthouse to observe one of my father's trials. I don't recall very much, except that my father lost and that the prosecutor was Mr. Von Karma. Von Karma was there 15 years ago As Gregory Edgeworth's courtroom foe What a coincidence to could have guessed 15 years later, he's here for the sun's arrest As we went to leave, an earthquake struck, trapping us in the elevator with the bailiff, Yanni Yogi. We were fine at first, but 
As time passed and no one came to help, my father and Mr. Yogi began to argue. Just then, something heavy fell at my feet. The bailiff's pistol. Hold it! Did you know at the time that it was a pistol? I don't know if I knew what it was, but I... I think I knew it was dangerous. But the air was so thin and they were fighting, I panicked. I picked up the gun and I threw it at the bailiff. I heard a single gun shot and a terrible scream. That's all I can remember. I wasn't even sure of that until today. A gun in the hands of a panicked child. Can he be blamed if the shot went wild? A single gun shot, a single scream. With the lack of oxygen, could it have been a dream? Hold it! Edgeworth, you're sure you only heard one gunshot? Yes, there's nothing else. My next memory is of waking up at the hospital. I've got you, Edgeworth. I've got you. Honorable members of the court, Miles Edgeworth recalls hearing only one gunshot. And yet, the case file states that the murder weapon was fired twice. Furthermore, this photograph of the crime scene shows two bullet holes. One in the heart of Gregory Edgeworth, another in the elevator door. Now I ask you, where did this second bullet hole come from? A bullet hole each in the victim and the door. Two gunshots recorded, a lesson no more. Little left were faded after hearing just one. Who else was there who could have fired the gun? Who killed Gregory Edgeworth? The first shot, fired accidentally by the young Miles Edgeworth, struck the elevator door. At this point, Miles fell unconscious. Therefore, the second shot, the shot that killed Gregory Edgeworth, must have been fired by someone else. But who could this someone else be? The real murderer, of course. Who killed Gregory Edgeworth? The bailiff said it wasn't him. The son's memories clearly did. Who killed Gregory Edgeworth? Objection! I knew I should have stepped in before your wild fantasies got out of hand. Mr. Wright, let me call your attention once more to that little case file you love so much. Right there, on the very first page, what does it say? No other evidence was found at the scene. Precisely. No second bullet was found anywhere near that elevator. But the bullet hole could have been made at any time. What? Without a second bullet, the case falls apart. Only one was found in Gregory Edgeworth's heart. If the gun was fired, was not twice his rights were closed. And Miles Edgeworth must have done it, and the case is clearly closed. He killed Gregory Edgeworth! Your Honor, I'm sorry to have wasted the court's time with this farce of a cross-examination. We're done here. I must say, it seems the prosecution is correct. No objections, Mr. Wright? Mr. Edgeworth? None, Your Honor. Everything Von Karma has said is true. Nick! Miles Edgeworth, you confess to killing your father? Yes. Come on, Nick! It's time for a turnabout! It feels as though I've been here before On the day I first entered the courtroom hall I should be saying so many things But my mind's gone blank and I can't begin to think The murderer? Run! It's time for the verdict. Who killed Gregory Edgeworth? His son! Objection! The second bullet has to exist. It was taken from the crime scene by the culprit. Preposterous. Why would this culprit spend time searching for a stray bullet? No, Von Karma. They had to take the bullet. The stray shot went through the elevator door and struck the real murderer. As unlikely as it sounds, I cannot deny the possibility. Deny it! Deny it now! Only the victim was wounded that day. There was no real murderer outside that elevator, and nothing to suggest there ever was. Maya's eyes suddenly shoot wide open. Mr. Edgeworth, didn't Von Karma only take one vacation in his career? Yes. It was right after he adopted me. Fifteen years ago. 
Phoenix, Maya, and Edgeworth stare at Von Karma in shock. <clears throat> if the defense has secrets, I hope you brought enough for the rest of the courtroom. The real murderer of DL6. Your Honor, I do have a suspect. One. Phoenix hesitates, then points at Von Karma. <gasps> the crowd is stunned into silence. Mr. Wright! I hope you realize that your accusation is incredibly serious. Not to mention foolish. It all adds up. Mr. Von Karma was in the courthouse that day, and the only one there with a motive. His perfect trial record was destroyed by a penalty, all thanks to an objection raised by Gregory Edgeworth. There were no witnesses, because everyone in the elevator had passed out. My mother wasn't a fraud! When she channeled Gregory Edgeworth, he really believed that Yogi had killed him! Or that I had. Was Father protecting me? You were walking by the elevator when, by pure chance, you were struck by the bullet fired by the young Miles Edgeworth. But Mr. Von Karma has never been admitted to a hospital. Why leave such a wound unattended? He must have been struck in a non-vital area. He recovered by himself during the only vacation of his career. Von Karma unconsciously grips his shoulder. This is... <clears throat> never in my life have I... After all, if you'd gone to a hospital, the bullet could have been used as evidence against you. Von Karma realizes what he's doing and releases his grip. When that elevator door opened and you saw the man who ruined your perfect record lying unconscious right next to a gun, what did you do? You cannot prove anything! The DL6 evidence went missing from the records room, isn't that right, cockroach? Phoenix proudly looks at Maya. Wrong. The defense has one single piece of evidence from DL6. He holds up the plastic bag. The bullet extracted from Gregory Edgeworth's heart. What? But I... Mm. And how, pray tell, does that prove anything at all? Edgeworth faces Von Karma. It's simple. If the ballistic markings on the bullet inside you are the same as on the bullet from my father's heart, that places you, with the gun, at the crime scene. You should know that, sir. The crowd begins murmuring angrily at Von Karma. If you think that I will play along, that I will trust any doctor in the world to cut me open and disprove your tale, you can trust me, pal! Gumshoe suddenly stands from the crowd, holding up a metal detector. Detective Gumshoe, explain yourself! Of course! The metal detector will tell us if Von Karma has the bullet inside him. What? It will be allowed. Von Karma openly clutches his shoulder. No! This is a violation of my privacy! I refuse! Gumshoe sweeps the metal detector over Von Karma's right shoulder, and it beeps. <laughs> Not so worthless now, huh, pal? Mr. Von Karma, you will let us remove the bullet from your shoulder, and we'll solve this case once and for all. The courtroom seems to rumble as Von Karma screams with primal fury. <sighs> that scream. I've heard it before. In my nightmare, in the elevator, 15 years ago. This whole time. After all these years, it was you? Suddenly, Von Karma's demeanor completely changes. My dear boy, Miles, my son, please, don't do this to me. I raised you. Everything you are is because of me. This is how you repay your dear father? Edgeworth calmly walks up to Von Karma and points, defense attorney style, in his face. Objection. You're not my father. You killed my father. And as a prosecutor, as Miles Edgeworth, I condemn you. Edgeworth, Edgeworth, that name is my curse! Von Karma pushes Edgeworth to the ground, <gasps> raising his cane to strike. I'll bury you, just like I buried your father! Gumshoe and Maggie jump into action. They pull out pistols and approach Von Karma from both sides. Gumshoe takes his cane and cuffs him. Well, Your Honor, that sounded like a confession to me. Yes, I must agree. 
This case is completely clear to me. I see no room for misinterpretation of the facts. What? No. No! This courtroom is a disgrace! You! Amateur! It's your fault I'm in this mess! Your story's mere conjecture, within you I just find The ramblings of a madman who's completely lost his mind You grasp at straws while standing with a condescending grin No matter how pathetic, you'll do anything to win Mia enters, invisible to all but Phoenix There are people in You're this You're bluffing! World will try you to haven't got a plan you. Acting frightening Nothing! You cursed stupid man! Like a stubborn foolish swine, you merely yell and whine! And at last this case will finally unwind! Some opponents are dishonest, they'll do anything to win! But now I know that I will not give in! And I won't stand for lying or accusing anymore. I know exactly what I'm fighting for. I fight for truth. So stand for part of the I fight for justice. I fight for everyone to have a fair chance. And when faced with tribulation, I think of my own inspiration. She taught me to always hold my stand. You're not guilty. We fight for all. We fight with honor, and we will never rest. Together we unite forever since the world's creation. And kind of saw its liberation. So throughout this litigation. As we pursue purification, no matter what the situation, we will fulfill our obligation for the laws of consecration, for the better of the nation, for the future of all. This court finds the defendant, Mr. Miles Edgeworth, not guilty. We The courtroom and Mia fade away. Fade to blackout. Scene 12. Later that night, at the Wright & Co. Law Offices. It is dark, just like the night of Mia's death. But this time, it's decorated with streamers and balloons for Edgeworth's celebratory not guilty party. Charlie the plant stands nice, tall, and watered, covered with Christmas lights. Hiding out in the office are Larry, Lotta, Gumshoe, Maggie, and Maya. Edgeworth comes in, blindfolded, guided by Phoenix. Okay, now! Phoenix flips on the lights as Edgeworth removes his blindfold. The others pop out! Surprise! They all rush to give Edgeworth balloons, cake, etc. while congratulating him. He is totally overwhelmed by this level of socialization and outpouring of love. Larry gives him a bum rush hug. My buddy Edgy, I told you Nick would get you free. He's a real ace attorney now, huh? Just like you. Congrats and you're not guilty, pal. Hey, Mr. Lawyer. Yes? I mean, no, the one with the funky hair. A beat as Edgeworth and Phoenix look at each other's hair. Lotta turns to Edgeworth. Dag nabbit, I'm talking to you, Strawberry Shortcake. I'm mighty sorry for, you know, trying to get you convicted and all. It happens to the best of us, yeah? Um, of course, I suppose I'm guilty of the same thing. Mr. Edgeworth, I'm sorry for running off the other day. On the contrary, Miss Fay, you have my firmest apologies and sincerest gratitude. I would be on death row were it not for you. He looks out over the smiling group, struck with emotion. This is... well... I must say, I was not expecting such a... Uh... Please excuse me for a moment. He exits, causing Phoenix to follow him. Larry chats with Lotta. The bullet was in his shoulder the whole time! Lotta holds up her camera. I know, butthead, I was there. Got some great shots, too. Maybe I should be an investigative photojournalist. 
You don't say, babe. Well, maybe we could investigate some of those shots over shots. They exit. Dick, did you hear what happened to Chief Prosecutor Skye? Fired? Well, that's the story. But she was just demoted. Working under Chief Gant now. Uh, typical. Well, I guess we've still got a lot more work to do. You with me? You can trust me, pal. They share a moment before exiting. Maya, alone on stage, watches them. She puts her hand to her magatama and exits in thought. Phoenix re-enters, looking for Edgeworth. Edgeworth? Edgeworth! Edgeworth finally reappears, approaching Phoenix. Right. I guess what I want to say is... I mean, I'm forever grateful for your foolhardy defense. You saved me, in more ways than one. But I had no idea that everyone here was... Edgeworth, we're your friends. It's what we do. Huh. Edgeworth is taken aback by this notion. I wish I knew what to do. After everything I've done, everyone I've locked away... You're not alone, Miles. Your friends are here to help you through it. I'm here. Phoenix could take Edgeworth's hand at this point. We could reopen those cases, run fair trials. Someday we could even help bring back the jury from both sides of the courtroom. We'll change the world together. That's an incredibly ambitious proposal, right? It's how you saved me all those years ago. Fighting for justice, protecting the innocent. You changed my life that day. You don't mean... that class trial? Don't tell me you really became a defense attorney just because of that. Because of me. Well... maybe? Phoenix. What? What am I supposed to say? You don't have to say anything. Beat. An embrace of some sort may be shared here. Regardless, Larry enters, oblivious to the situation. Oh, there you are, Eddie. Here, I've got a present for you. He hands him an old envelope. Edgeworth reads the front. Thirty-eight dollars? That's a random amount. What can you buy with that? Uh, lunch money for a few days? This whole time, after all these years, it was you? Whoa, Nick. This is a happy moment. Let's not bicker and argue over who stole from who. Don't arrest me, Edgy. Phoenix is dumbfounded. Right? You know the saying. When something, something smells... smells. Phoenix sighs, and the rest of the party barges in. Hey, let's go get some real food, pals. Something besides instant noodles could do you well, Detective. Burgers! Nick Street. Um, objection? Sustained. Miss Faye, it's only fair the meal is on me. It's what you all deserve. He holds up the lunch money envelope. I don't suppose this will suffice? <laughs> Edgeworth laughs. Lights shift as the offices and its inhabitants melt away. Scene 13. The train station. A train horn is heard in the background. Maya sits on a bench as Phoenix struggles to carry in her heavy suitcase. Alright, I guess that's everything. Ah, thanks, Nick. Maya jumps up and picks up the suitcase easily. She stops, and she and Phoenix look at each other for a small beat. You know it's not too late. You could stay. We could- Nick, it's okay. This is the right thing to do. It's up to me to preserve my mother's legacy. I'm gonna restart my training and become a full-fledged spirit medium. Will I ever see you again? Um, yeah? I'll only be a train right away. So dramatic. I swear, Edgeworth must be rubbing off on you. <laughs> but, Nick, are you sure you'll be okay? Yeah, I'm okay. It's just... I guess I've gotten used to having you around. I'm really going to miss you. You know, Nick... 
Last time we were in court, I heard Mia's voice. You heard her too? And it made me realize the people we love never really leave us, you know? They make us who we are. And I'll be here when we're far apart. Never fear, you'll be in my heart. I hope you know I'm glad we met. I'll carry on with no regret. Just promise me you won't forget that for you. They share one last hug. Maya exits. Phoenix waves goodbye as the train horn blows again and it leaves the station. Spotlight as Phoenix sits alone on the bench for a moment. Finally, the case is done, but soon there'll be another one. My search for truth has just begun, and yes, I know, and yes, I know, there'll be dangers, there'll be crime, but I'm not afraid this time. I'll face the world, and I'll be fine. Because I know I'm I'm not not alone. Finally, the nightmare subsided. What I've done cannot be erased. But with new and old friends beside me, I know the future I can face. I know the world will never be perfect, but I'll fight for all that it's worth. I know these trials have brought us together. I know this day is our rebirth. Here I am with the past far behind us. Here we stand with the future ahead. With you trusting me to fulfill our decree To seek justice for all Here we fight for what we love and believe in With your life standing firm as our guide And with each passing day we'll be paving the way For a future me awakening End of Act 2. Turnabout and Ace Attorney Musical by the Maya Fay Protection Squad. Abigail Stanton, Diana Heslin, Elizabeth Lawrence, Catherine Leister, Joel Williams, Maxwell DeZibus, Olivia Ramsey, and Sarah Schoen. Based on Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney by Capcom, and adapted from Turnabout Musical by PW Musical Productions. Phoenix Wright was played by Ren Alberg. Maya Fay, MJ Chestang. Miles Edgeworth, Gavarock. Mia Fay, Da Awkward Lauren. Manfred von Karma, Zach Young. Dick Gumshoe, Dominic Miller. The Judge, Eric Larea. Larry Butts, The Singing Koala. Lotta Hart, Twy Fairy. Red White, Hunter Oschleger. Yanni Yogi, Broadway Man 23. Maggie Bird, Queen Creeps. Lana Sky, Zoe Lee, Winston Payne, Ray O'Hare, Frank Sowett, Drama Josh, Marvin Grossberg, Bryn Tanner, Polly, Sassmaster Mickey, Young Edgeworth, Snea Kumar, 
Young Phoenix, Chaos, Young Larry, Tamara Fritz, Gregory Edgeworth, James Turrell, The Thinker, Matthew Toronto. The core ensemble was performed by Ambrose Clark, Bridget Jack Foley, Chara Lynn, David A. Myers, James Turrell, Matt Smith, and Valerian. The child ensemble was performed by Archer Wells, Ashley Smith, Aurora Williams, Katie Knox, Matthew Williams, Robin Carlisle, Sassmaster Mickey, and Tamara Fritz. The narrator was Maxwell DeZibus. Other parts were played by Danny Paparozzi, Julia Heslin, and members of the cast and production team. The lyrics and music were written by Abigail Stanton, Amy Garrett, Brandon Lee Torres, Bryn Tanner, Comfortably Numb, Danny Paparozzi, Diana Heslin, Ed Garrett, Elizabeth Lawrence, Joel Williams, Justin Briner, Catherine Leister, Katie Knox, Kemi Haiti Stanton, Lizard Lee, Logan Mello, Lucia Lebosvia, Mary Russ, Matt Ferda, Matthew Toronto, Maxwell DeZibus, Mikhail Van Bell, Olivia Ramsey, Samantha Smith, Sarah Shope, Sarah Toronto, and Tom Laughlin. Original themes from the Ace Attorney series by Masukazu Sugimori, Naoto Tanaka, and Noriyuki Iwadare. The book was written by Joel Williams, Maxwell DeZibus, and Olivia Ramsey. Edited by Abigail Stanton, Diana Heslin, Catherine Leister, and Sarah Shope. Adapted from the original animation screenplay by Amy Garrett, Lizard Lee, Lucio Lobosvia, Matt DiCarlo, Rachel Blyer, Sarah Toronto, and Tom Laughlin. And the stage script by Diana Heslin and Sarah Shope. This audio production was produced by Nerdification Media, Diana Heslin and Sarah Shope, who also managed the corresponding Indiegogo campaign. Special thanks to all of our backers. Production organization by Sarah Shope. Concept album mixing and cleanup by Diana Heslin. Instrumental mastering by Elizabeth Lawrence. Table read mixing and cleanup by Diana Heslin, Joel Williams, and Sarah Shope. Additional crowd and effects mixing by Sarah Shope. Quality check by Maxwell DeZibus. Final management by Abigail Stanton, Elizabeth Lawrence, and Sarah Shope. Music direction and ensemble coordination by Sarah Shope. Turnabout and Ace Attorney Musical is a fan project created for nonprofit and shared online for free. Thanks for listening. Wherever there's a case to try, we'll be there on the trail. We'll keep on searching for the truth, and I don't intend to fail. We'll there's no fail. place I will not go, there's nothing I won't do. I'll be with we'll stand you. together we'll side by side, side, and we'll see it through. And when witnesses clearly lie, to throw us off our case, we'll find a contradiction to rob in their small face. And after we have made our careful selection, with great resolve and great inflection, we'll deflect their misdirection and with evidence as our way will yell, 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 yell. Objection! Blackout. The end.